Okay, greetings from the United Kingdom. Uh, it's an hour later than I expected to deliver this. I'll let you into a little secret. There was a panic about an hour ago when I couldn't log in because uh, we got the time zone wrong. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. Uh, anyway, uh, th thank you, conference organisers, for inviting me to speak on this topic. Uh, uh, I, I think this will sit across various of the subjects that were mentioned in the introduction a few slides ago. Uh, and hopefully be of general interest is something that's established and running. So first off, for those that don't know me, uh, uh, I founded Data Liberate. I'm an independent consultant and senior evangelist. I'm not going to witter my way through, all the way through this or we'll never finish. But I've been around computing and the semantic web and linked data for far too long. I've uh, been involved in the W3C, worked with Google OCLC, who, who used to employ me at one stage. Uh, and work with various clients, including the National Library Board of Singapore, who I've been privileged to be involved with for many years now, leading up to the, the project that we're discussing. So a brief agenda of, of what we're going to be talking about today. Quick, quick reminder about the National Library and their resources and their knowledge graph ambitions. Um, the uh, linked data management system that was built and launched a while ago. And then the important part of the pre presentation, the continued developments on beyond the launch of that system uh, around data sharing with their ent entity data service, user experience enrichment uh, across systems in their library using something called the sidebar API, which I'll explain a bit later on. Uh, and then enhancing the data quality of the knowledge graph by using external authorities to do that. So the National Library Board of Singapore brings together three operations, really. Uh, they run the public library network with 28 public libraries, plus the library system that backs it up, etc. They do the traditional National Library stuff, preserving print and, and digital heritage, legal deposit, reference collections, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, they bring in the National Archives uh, data and are responsible for bringing that to the world. So behind the scenes, they have a lot of stuff. Uh, the library system's got over 5 million print collections in it. We've got over, over 35,000 oral history interviews. There's over, over a million photographs, all sorts of stuff which they bring online to their community via several user interfaces. There's a, a traditional library OPAC. There's a search interface onto the National Archives. Uh, there's a, a content management system, which is used to bring music and art and uh, pictures to the, to the public nature. They've got uh, a system called Infopedia, which is... Uh, Singaporean folk, Singaporean folk, that's difficult to say, Singaporean focus encyclopedia. They've got an electronic journal, they've got a history site, etc. And bringing these together raised various issues, which was driving their ambition, which they brought to the table some four years ago now, to, to enable the discovery and display of entities from different sources in, combined in, in a combined interface. So that's to bring together the resources, both physical and digital across the library, and bring together the diverse systems, some of which the interfaces I've just showed you, uh, for the National Library, National Archives, and the Public Libraries Network in, in a linked data environment. And finally, to provide a, a, an interface for the staff, the staff to manage and, and uh, the entities and their descriptions and relationships. But this ambition had some technical aspects as well. They wanted to produce a knowledge graph that was daily up to date. They didn't want a project that pulled together data and, uh, and gave you a snapshot that was a month or six months or even a year out of date. They wanted it daily up to date with the changes to the data in the library system and other associated systems. They didn't want to replace the current cataloging processes and practices. They wanted the, uh, the library system 
to be still cataloging in MARC uh, as the current processes in the library management system. They wanted their authority control system, which is in a system called TTE, internal to them. They wanted that maintained in its current environment. And they wanted the Dublin Core content management for the content management management system sites and the National Archives to continue as is. They wanted to move in a linked data direction, but they didn't want to disrupt everything else on the way. And they also wanted the data shareable with the, with the wider world. Hence, linked open data was, was a key aspect to this. And not just the library wider world and people that are interested in library resources, but the wider, wider world, in which case schema.org as a vocabulary becomes important because that's what the search engines request uh, to help you deliver their more accurate searching with data. And so in, in summary, they wanted an aggregated source of truth, not a new source of truth, but a source of truth, which is an aggregation of all the cataloging and, uh, and data management practices across the library. They awarded a contract uh, to deliver this to a consortium of three organisations, uh, Metafax, who bring their Metafactory uh, low-code knowledge graph platform to the party, uh, which delivers semantic knowledge modelling and semantic search and discovery. Cumin, who are an Amazon Web Services partner, very important to this project, based in Singapore and a lot of experience uh, delivering uh, services to the public sector in, in Singapore and bringing up the rear was Data Liberate, which is which is me bringing my many years of linked data, schema.org, semantic web, library management, et cetera, experience to the party. So to deliver this ambition, we, we soon settled on a basic data model, which is in linked data form uh, and using two well-known vocabularies, BibFrame from the Library of Congress to capture the, the bibliographic details of bibliographic records, and schema.org to deliver structured data for search engines, etc. Also, using this data model, we could use schema.org representations of the content management system data, the National Archives data, and the authority data from the TTE system. Well, well within the capability of schema.org. And then we wanted to add schema.org enrichment to the bid frame data. We didn't want to replace bid frame. We wanted to enhance it uh, with the more widely available schema.org environment. So the effect of this is schema.org became the lingua franca vocabulary for the knowledge graph, which means all entities, persons, place, creative works, whatever, uh, will be described as using schema.org as a minimum. Not exclusively schema.org, but as a minimum, which greatly simplified the programming and the software behind this system, because you could always assume that if it was a person, for instance, you would have a schema.org name and it would have a schema.org date of birth. Uh, and it, it meant regardless of where the record was sourced from, most of the programming could make general assumptions like that. That's not to say you can't deep, deepen your engagement with the data and go into BibFrame and others. Talking of data, they've got a lot of it. So with some 3.1 million uh, source records being derived from the source systems, expanding to an entity count of, of about 15 million. And this is handled by data ingest pipelines, triggered by data upload from a source system. So this is an Amazon Web Services system, and there's a, a there's a, a available to the users within the National Library, an area where if they upload a file of a of a known format, it will tr trigger an upload into into the system. From the integrated library system, this would be daily, and it's in a MARC XML uh, format for additions, modifications, and deletes uh, of records within the library system. And the Library of Congress or open source script marked to BibFrame 2 is used to create the BibFrame representation from MARC. 
and the Bib Frame to Schema uh, from the Bib Frame to Schema.org community group to then enrich that with Schema.org data. The authorities file uh, managed in the TTE system is output in the bespoke CSV format, so there's a conversion for that. And the content management system and national archives weekly and monthly updates uh, were, were managed via a Dublin core to schema.org process. A little picture of what's going on here is the data is uploaded into the Amazon Web Services environment and an Amazon EC2 instance spots this and fires off uh, processing, which uses AWS Lambda server, serverless uh, services to process the records in, in the cloud and translate into the bib frame and schema representation in an RDF format, which is then uploaded into uh, an Ontotex GraphDB triple store in, in RDF form. That data is then used by a, a Metafactory instance to deliver the public user interfaces on this. And in a separate Metafax instance, separate for security reasons, there is the data management interface, which services the needs of the curators. So, so there we have, in fairly simple terms, an environment where lots of records are converted into BibFrame and Schema.org or RDF and loaded into a triple store, which becomes the knowledge graph. But there becomes anybody that's loaded a lot of records into a linked data environment will know there's always a need for entity reconciliation. There's lots and lots and lots of source entities, some 10 million of them in this environment. And you get lots of duplication. A particular example here is if you look at all the entities created when the whole library management data set is uploaded, we end up with 160 individual entities uh, representing Lee Kuan Yew, the first prime minister of Singapore. In another example, uh, an organisation entity uh, has created uh, 21 instances in the content management system, one in National Archives, 66 in the library system, and one, thankfully, from the authority system. But users only want to see one of each. They only want to do a search for Lee Kuan Yew and get one answer uh, 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 about the Prime Minister. So we had to de deliver a data model that would satisfy this need while still accepting the fact that the data is changing on a daily basis. So we created what we term an adaptive data model. We have servicing entities, individual representations of the source data. This is where uh, there was 160 of these for Lee Kuan Yew in the library system. Then we have some aggregation entities which track the relationship between source entities for the same real world thing not copying attributes around, just monitoring relationships at this stage. And then that enables us to create primary entities, which are the ones that are searchable by users, displayable to users, and they represent a consolidation of the aggregated source data and some manually managed environments. I feel a picture need here, so let me draw a picture. So. Using a standard feature of most RDF triple stores uh, called name graphs, we've got an area reserved in the knowledge graph to handle library system data, another one for the content management system, another one for the authority data, and another one, I won't draw another line at this stage here, for the National Archives. And when a mark record gets processed, uh, that mentions Singapore Art Museum as an uh, organisation. An organisation entity is created in that area. But as more mark records are processed, it gets mentioned again and again. So here we have three entities that may be subtly different in their content, but representing the same thing. So this is where we bring in an aggregation entity uh, to, to reference these entities as all belonging to to the same real world thing. Similarly, in the content management system at the same time, some of its imports will bring in uh, one or more uh, source entities, which are then aggregated together. 
And even though the authority to control system would, uh, would theoretically only bring in unique uh, uh, entity types, we, we copy the pattern here so that the processing behind the system that's controlling this can operate in the same way and scale across all four, including the National Archives, uh, sources here, or could scale across even more sources if they expand the, the, the system. But what the users want is what we term the primary entity, the one that aggregates the descriptions from all these source entities and uh, provides us the single view of that entity type. And the aggregation entities manage the relationships between here. Looking at it at uh, yet another angle, using the graphical display, which is part of the MetaFactory platform, here we're looking at that prime entity uh, for Singapore Art Museum. And if we identify the is aggregated by relationships, this identifies the aggregation entities, one for each area of the system. And, and if we uh, open up the relationships between the... Uh, the National Archives uh, aggregation and its single source entity, and similarly between the uh, uh, authority control and its single um, source entity. But if you look at the content management system, you see it aggregates 21 individual source entities. And if we look at the aggregation of the uh, library system, it aggregates together 67 or 60 six entities. So what we've got is some 80 plus source entities that are potentially changing on a daily basis, being tracked through four aggregation entities to, do, to derive the primary entity at, at the top of the tree, if you like. Uh, this is what I would like to call the entity iceberg, where visible to the outside world are the primary entities where, which allow for discovery with the middle layer of uh, aggregation entities that are bringing together the source entities that are regularly being in ingested on the ingestion pipeline. And the whole lot is managed by a data management interface by the curators of the system. So we've ended up with the National Library Board's knowledge graph, which quite spookily at the moment sits at 666 million triples. 10 million source entities, 5.8 million primary entities, which are ag aggregation of the source derived entities, which is searchable, shared with the world. And as a matter of interest, the split between them, uh, if you look in this pie chart, the, uh, uh, the purple area is creative works, the black area are persons, uh, the green area are organisation entities, we've got orange per place entities, and the remainder of uh, uh, what we call defined terms, uh, which would be the uh, subjects and topics within the system. So the linked data management system is powered by this knowledge graph, which is updated daily. It's a new separate environment built on established systems. There were no changes in source cataloging practices. No cataloger retraining was required. Uh, and it wasn't just linked data for mark, uh, to replace mark-based data. It was across the whole library. There was no replacement systems to implement linked data. Mark-based ILS swap out did happen. So I'm saying nothing changed. And, what happened in one of our regular meetings, uh, we were told that they're, they're swapping vendors for their integrated library system in mid-project. Uh, and apart from a bit of test data, no, nothing impacted the linked data project at all. The uh, Mark XML still got uploaded from this brand new library system that they changed over and things went along uh, happily. So we have this linked data management system delivering linked data benefits back into the uh, NLB as an organisation. And that's where I'd like to move on to developments beyond that. Uh, the first of these is uh, what we call the Entity Data Service, which basically is an open linked data interface, dereferencing entity URIs. So if 
an entity URI is identified as, as a link from a, another site, it would be resolved into a description. Uh, standard content uh, negotiation, so your favourite flavour of RDF download would be available. Uh, also manual downloads from the interface. Embedded schema.org, opening up the potential of uh, search engines looking at this data and actually understanding it with enhanced navigation uh, for such an interface. Here's a screen screenshot of the entity data service looking at a person entity at this stage for Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, so you've got the usual attributes down the left hand side, uh, also known as references, birthplace, birth date, death date, uh, children, etc. Uh, on the right hand side, we've got navigation to other services, so effectively a same as relationship, plus an image provided by the National Library Board. Scrolling down, we can see things like parent relationships, nationalities, awards, alumni, etc. Kind of thing that that spreads across the descriptions that we described. This a lot of those attributes have come in from the authority control system and the content management system, enriching the basic data that was provided by passing mark records out of the library system. And as to enhance navigation, there's three blocks at the bottom that would open up links to works by Lee Kuan Yew, works that Lee Kuan Yew contributed to, and works about Lee Kuan Yew that you can then navigate around. And then you've got the download source data bit at the end. I would love to have shown you this live, but it's actually coming soon. Uh, it's passed all its um, uh, operational tests and acceptance tests, etc. But as this system is provided on the Singaporean government network, which doesn't just have library systems on it, some of the security hoops the interface needs to jump through are slightly higher than one would normally expect uh, in, in a general, almost commercial website. So as soon as it's leaped over those and a couple of bits of housekeeping is done, this will be launched live on the environment. Another thing that I wanted to show was enriching the user journey for the other systems in the National Library Board. As we know, systems are often silos, which means user search and navigation is constrained by the data that's within that silo. Whereas the knowledge graph is populated from several individual systems and their entities are aggregated and related across system sources which provides, if you like, the fuel to be able to explore between and across systems uh, via a navigation, uh, navigational interface sidebar. And that's plugged into the user interface of the previous system, if you like, powered by a JavaScript sidebar API. Let me give you an example of this. So this is a screenshot of uh, Singaporean Infopedia, which is their... Uh, locally based um, encyclopedia. And on the right hand side there, you can see uh, a, a sidebar of information of extra navigation. Let me bring it across and have a look. This is the representation of a primary entity identified within uh, the knowledge graph, the linked data knowledge graph. So that description is coming from the primary entity, which is an aggregation of various things. Uh, the name is uh, the, the main identified one, and the other links uh, are relationships within the knowledge graph. Now, this is managed by the JavaScript sidebar API. So this JavaScript API is dropped into the user interface of the uh, encyclopedia system. And when the page is displayed, an API to the uh, an API call is made. Um, and Passed with it is the identifier of the page that the user is on at that moment in time. And because the Infopedia data is some of the data that's uh, loaded into the knowledge graph on a regular basis, we can identify the source entity related to this particular page and via the aggregation tree, identify the primary entity that's associated with it. And the data about that primary entity is then re returned from the API call. Uh, so the description includes a list of 
what you might term about related entity IDs used to build the lower half of that sidebar. Clicking on the sidebar trigger new API calls to rebuild the sidebar display as entity relationships are followed or navigated around the system. So effectively, we're getting knowledge graph navigation via a sidebar, but not losing the context of the page that the user was on when they started that process. This is also coming soon. Love to have shown this straight away. Functionality is tested and been accepted, etc. But it depends on a, a user interface refresh from, the, from their content management system. Uh, they were doing the refresh anyway, uh, and that's the best place to introduce navigational terms, if you like, at the time. So, so that's about the knowledge graph adding value to the um, other services within the National Library and, uh, and, and broader sharing. Now I'm going to talk about using the outside world to enhance the quality of the knowledge graph itself. The first one is Library of Congress NIME Authority File URI ingestion. That's a bit of a mouthful. But basically, for persons and organisations that get created with an LCNEF URI, which have been created via the Library of Congress Mark to Bib Frame script, picking out the URI from the Delhi Zero in the Mark record, then, then created is an entity using that URI uh, they create an RDFS label value from the mark record, which concatenates together the dollar $A and dollar $D, for instance, from a 700 field. These values are not controlled. So the URI itself is controlled, but very often the dollar $A, dollar $D and other subfields are manually created uh, and, and can end up with variation. What we aim to do here is to use the LCNEF authority data to introduce naming consistency, looking up against LCNEF to identify and ingest an authoritative version uh, of that entity. Uh, and when that, that authoritative version is almost treated as a separate, separate data source. So in the aggregation process, those entities that have come from the LCNEF take precedence in primary entity consolidation and the results shown to the user. Let me have a quick look at this and no apologies for showing some Mark XML on the screen, but we're looking at an extract of a Mark uh, record here where the subfield zero uh, includes the Library of Congress URI and the subfield A and D contain Q, Eric, 1965. The output of the Library of Congress script is a bib frame data in XML format. So you can see the entity, uh, the agent entity here has got the, the uh, Library of Congress URI as its URI. And the label is Q, 1965. Well, that seems all fine and happy. Have a look at another Mark record. This one for its dollar $A and dollar $D. Uh, has got Ku, Eric 1965 as the dollar A. So when that gets concatenated together, uh, we end up with Ku, Eric 1965, 1965, which is obviously not right from a catalogist's point of view. But looking into the knowledge graph and pu pulling up this entity from, uh, with a, uh, a Sparkle query, I can see it's actually got three labels. Uh, We've got Q, Eric 1965, Q, Eric 1965, and Q, Eric, Q, Eric 1965, 1965. Which, which is the correct one? Now, I would imagine any catalogers amongst us would soon spot which was the correct one, but uh, not a piece of software that's trying to um, manually work this out. If we look at the Library of Congress data at the end of that particular uh, URI, we can see we can get Ku, Eric 1965 being the correct term. So that would be ingested from the LCNEF and given precedence in the consolidation of the primary entity. Another similar approach, and this is for entities that haven't got external URIs, this is for person and organisations 
from anywhere in the knowledge graph, wherever they've come from, whether they've come from the library system or the content management system or the archives, we perform a string matching lookup against LCNAF data for the schema name values. Remember schema.org being the lingua franca, every entity will have a schema name value. This is an automatic backup background process in happen it's happening when the triple store that's supporting the knowledge graph is not particularly busy. If an exact match is found, we ingest the LCNAF entity a bit like we did with the other process, uh, and that takes precedence in the consolidation. If it's a close match, if the software considers it to be a close match, it's added to a list of match candidates, which a human creator then either accepts as a match or not. And they do that by this interface in the data management tool that we provide. Uh, let me zoom one up so I can see it a bit better. We've got the link data management system record on the left-hand side. So that's the aggregation of the source entities together. And you can see it's got various schema name entities and in fact, a couple of birth dates. Uh, uh, there's a note of which source environment that these came from. Uh, and then the proposed match from the Library of Congress data. And then on the right hand side, the curator has the ability to either make that exact match and then publish it in the system or discard the match, which stops it showing up as a, a, as a potential again. So, in summary, we have have the National Library Board of Singapore's linked data management system that was two years in development and has been live and operational for a year and a half. It's built currently on a 66, 666 million triple knowledge graph, which is automatically updated daily using schema.org and BibFrame in its vocabulary. It's built on, but doesn't replace the established systems and practices. So they've been able to move to this linked data environment without, if you like, throwing their other systems out with the bathwater and having to retrain everybody on site. It provides a linked data service for the National Library Board, ex utilising external authorities to enrich and standardise these descriptions. It's part of the linked data open cloud via the entity data service. Uh, and is enriching user journeys in the non their non-linked data systems. Those last two should have been will be rather than does, but they will arrive fairly soon. Uh, and, and that's a summary of the system, what, how it looks, how it's structured, what it does, and how it's been built upon over the last 18 months. And that's all I wanted to say, basically. Do we have any questions? Great, thank you so much, Richard. What a wonderful presentation. Um, we actually do have a, a question from Huda. Um, I can read it out loud, or it's up to you if you want to read it in the Q and A section. Uh, I can't find the Q and A section. Okay, how about I'll read it up to you? I've got three screens. I'm sure. <laughs> no worries. I'll ask them all. There's a it's a one part, two part question. So. Um, the question is, uh, with new functionality ag aggregation now possible, have you had any user feedback or done any user testing about the current in interface? The, the interface at the moment, uh, there's two interfaces. There's a the public user interface, which was trialed within um, the, the National Library Board, but wasn't launched initially. Um, because they wanted to, to maintain their current systems and, if you like, e evolve the community. And that, that has become the basis of the entity data service. That, at the time when it was first uh, developed, did have user testing. And, and most people liked the entity-based navigation around the system. It takes a little bit of getting used to if you're uh, uh, used to the navigation in a traditional library interface. Uh, but uh, it, it, it was well received and we're looking forward to seeing how the entity data service is received, even though it's, that has been developed to be focused on people that understand the data, if you like, uh, so more the library community than uh, the, the individual uh, patron environment. Uh, 
the curators of the system uh, use the data management interface, which has the same discovery front end on as as the uh, entity data service. And uh, I, I think they they like it. <laughs> It's, it's about the best way to describe it. We we haven't had major concerns. Obviously, data curators are really uh, concerned about the quality of the data. And it, this exercise has been a great way to identify uh, anomalies in your data. As you know, if, if you change the data format, the anomalies creep out the woodwork. So this linked data exercise has, has been yeah, very useful in that environment. I don't know whether that answered your question, but. Uh... Oh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, and there was actually a, Huda had another uh, question, too. Uh, even though the linked data implementation did not require any changes to cataloging, do you know if any impact to catalogers decisions based on the discovery option options now possible with the primary entities in the modeling of relationships with the linked data? One question. <laughs> Long question. I, I can see where they're coming from on that. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, one of the things that was initially apparent was the curators of the linked data systems did start identifying anomalies in the source data because of the what would happen is you'd aggregate uh, two source entities for the same thing together and suddenly find uh, the primary entity had three or four uh, peculiar names or uh, conflicting dates of birth or uh, that kind of thing. And that was fed back um, through normal channels back to the curator community, which I think they, back to the cataloging community rather, which I think they appreciate. So quite often, rather than trying to manually fix the data in the low, in, in linked data management system, they would identify an anomaly like that back to the cataloging community who would fix the problem in the source library management system or contact management system, etc. And then the next time there was an update uh, of data, it would then reappear and fix itself in, in, in the linked data management system. I, I, I'm not really aware of how much searching of the linked data management system the catalogers in the individual source environments um, have taken. I, I know they're aware of it, but I don't know how much regular daily use they make of it. Great, lovely. And Chloe Koda said thank you in the chat. So wonderful. And also uh, expressing her thanks for your presentation. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, we do have one other question in the Q&A um, from Dessa. Have you encountered any limitations in using the schema.org vocabulary for your system? If so, have you, how have you dealt with these gaps? It's, yeah, there are limitations within using schema.org because obviously that that's a, a, a generic global uh, should be able to d describe, um, you know, s selling a boat, uh, buying a house, um, the, the the latest shoes in a shoe shop, as well as bibliographic environment. The the bibliographic description in schema.org is fairly well featured. Uh, not blowing my own trumpet, but I did share the group that uh, promoted getting bibliographic terms into schema.org. For the use in the general management, discovery, uh, maintenance, et cetera, of the entities within the knowledge graph, we haven't tripped over any major limitations at all. What you, what, because the decision was to pair it with BibFrame uh, for the um, bibliographic entities specifically coming out of the library management system, whether they be from a translation of Mark, or you can imagine a situation where raw bib frame could come in as well. And any time we got into a very specific data situation where we needed to delve into the detail well below what schema.org could do, the bib frame is there to help us. So I, I, I think it validates the decision that, yes, you do need the bib frame, for certain uh, surfaces, and uh, and if you're sharing data within the bibliographic community, that will be important as well. But for the general management of the system, and, and particularly 
uh, driving the discovery interface, etc. The schema dialog does does a really good job. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, we don't um, have any further questions in the Q and A. Um, Let's give it a. Just go ahead. Did we? Uh, did Jessica? Jessica had their hand raised. Uh, did we want to? Jessica, did you have a question much earlier, or was that just uh, addressed already? If you're still with us, and I can allow you to unmute if you don't want to use the chat. I I, see, I still see her, Jessica here. I know there's so many Jessicas. <laughs> Thanks, <Okay>. Jessica. <laughs> the other Jessica, though, I think was Jessica Gonzalez. I don't see her in the in the attendees anymore. She's, she, I see her in my view. Of it. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, okay. But yeah, the hand is down. So I just thought I would check in. Thank you. Um, I guess just to, if there's any other further questions that might percolate after your, your presentation, Richard, is there any, any way that folks can reach out to you or connect uh, with the, you? The they they can reach out to me on on, on email um rjw at dataliberate.com i'm sure uh, any questions that come through the conference uh, will get forwarded to me i'm more than happy to um, um answer those offline lovely thank you so much i'll drop your uh, email in, in the chat 